Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you for joining us from wherever you are. Um, so, yes, I'm going to talk about the possibility to introduce nonlinear bodies uh, in the multibody dynamics solution. Very excited to be talking about this. There's a lot of uh, interesting things going on and a lot of information to share. So I'll get right into the presentation. We hope to, for me to be talking around about 40 to 45 minutes, and then that will give us a chance at the end for some Q&A. If you do have questions, please include them in the chat window so we'll be ready to start when we get to that part of the, of the session. So with that, let's dive right in. Okay, looking at the agenda then, first of all, I'd like to start off with a little discussion on why you might want to include nonlinear bodies. And if you've made the decision to do so, then what are your options? We'll finish up with some application examples, and then, as I said, we'll get into a Q&A session after that. Okay, so why nonlinear flexibility? You may have a, a system or a component that is geometrically nonlinear. What do I mean by that? Well, um, above a certain amount of displacement or deformation, a linear flexible body is no longer going to be Maybe it's no longer going to be accurate. So what we've done here is take this twist beam and, you know, we've applied a certain force to one side of it, like a bump on one side of the rear suspension here, and we've modeled it two ways. We've had a single linear flexible body. That's the MNF, the modal neutral file representation, the dotted blue line. And we've taken the same geometry and the same boundary conditions, and we've reproduced that in our nonlinear uh, capability max flex, and I'll introduce you to that in a moment. And you can see here with the same force, the displacement is different. Um, and and it, it, it kind of, uh, the, the difference starts fairly early on, but is negligible for quite some time. And it becomes more and more noticeable the, the higher the displacement. So at some point or other, the linear flexible body uh, may not be as accurate as you need. And what that means is that, you know, if your component is, is maybe not uh, high enough fidelity, then the results you're going to get at the system level using that component are going to be the same. So here on the right-hand side, uh, we're showing camber angle, which is the result of, of, you know, a number of different things going on in the system. But there is a difference between looking at this uh, twist beam as a linear flex and as a, as a nonlinear. On the left-hand side, we're showing a sway bar here, which, you know, maybe in this particular test is not undergoing very significant displacement, but under certain extreme maneuvers, uh, the difference in, in height between one side and the other side of a sway bar uh, would be very significant. And this may be another uh, opportunity to look at that component in a nonlinear geometric fashion. And then finally, you may be scratching your head and wondering why, you know, I've got some test results of stiffness, force displacement types of characteristics, and they're not agreeing uh, with my linear flexible representation. It might just be that you want to try a nonlinear analysis and see if you get better, better agreement. If not, then obviously you need to go back and look at something else. So here's a very simple uh, example. Uh, and, and it's not always that a linear flexible body is going to be stiffer or less stiff. Uh, it can happen either way. This is particular an in-plane bending uh, this plate here is falling under its own weight, so simply a gravitational load, and it's supported at four corners with uh, with a simple bushing. Uh, but you're seeing some fair, I mean, some significantly different results here between modeling this as a, a linear flexible body, the red curve, um, and as a nonlinear flexible body, the blue curve. Not only is the displacement for the linear flexible significantly higher because of the way that the displacements uh, are being processed, from the linear flexible representation, uh, but also the frequency content is different. You can you can see the, the kind of sine curve um, is a different frequency, a higher frequency with nonlinear. So that's geometric nonlinearity. That might be something you need to consider. There may well be material nonlinearity. For instance, in some cases, um, especially in in the use of rubber materials like suspension bushings or uh, cab mounts, isolators, the material itself is nonlinear in nature. So you need a way of representing that. You may have an event that's quite extreme, 
And you could be saying to yourself, you know, I wonder if we'll actually get to a yield point anywhere in my system, and maybe we'll, we'll go material plasticity beyond uh, linear elastic. But you don't know. And if you just look at it as linear elastic, as we'll see later, uh, you, you may never know. So there, there could be some situations where you want to know if it's going to yield. There may be some other situations where you're pretty sure it's going to yield. You may even know for sure it will. The thing is, what's going to happen after that? So in all of these cases, you, you also might want to consider uh, the use of a nonlinear representation for a higher fidelity response. There's also the case of, um, you know, if you've got large displacements like we were seeing in that twist beam axle, uh, one fairly common approach is to split it up. And rather than having one flexible body, one MNF as we call it, you can split it up, you discretize it, and have multiple MNFs, which is a very good approach, absolutely nothing wrong with it. And we can see here in this helicopter example, the blades, uh, as they settle under, under static loading, undergo a relatively large displacement. And you can see here in, in the still picture down at the bottom, um, the, you know, the stiffness of these multiple MNFs is very good. There is a, a, a bit of a challenge, though, uh, because uh, of the way they're connected, so the boundaries between the adjacent um, flexible bodies, uh, it, it's not, it's, it's very difficult to post-process stress across those boundaries. So you get this discontinuity. Uh, this is a stress plot here, and you can see that, you can actually see where the boundaries between the, um, the multiple flexible bodies are, because we can't smooth the stress uh, results out across those boundaries. So, you know, very good uh, uh, flexibility representation. It just has some limitations in post-processing uh, this approach. Okay, so we've looked at some cases where you may need to consider nonlinearity. So what kind of tools have we given you uh, to be able to introduce this into your model? Let's look at those. So here we have the Adams environment. Uh, the first thing you could do would be something, a new native element we have called FE part. And I'll be explaining what each of these are in, in the subsequent slides. So you could take that approach. Uh, over the last couple of years, we have introduced ACSI, which is the Adams co-simulation interface. And this is really a co-simulation interface or a gateway to um, a number of other products. The first release was co-simulation with Mark. We are about to release in the summer of this year a co-simulation with a discrete element modeling package called EDEM. This is particularly useful where you're dealing with bulk materials. So here in the example, uh, we've got an Adams machine, the excavator, uh, digging a hole. And what it's digging into is modeled with uh, discrete element method. So the material that's being dug into and transported uh, is uh, co-simulation with EDEM. And then others, and we're really open to suggestions from users like you as to what's next. We, you know, we've been asked to do it with um, uh, things like CFD, computational fluid dynamics, very interesting for airflow, uh, air resistance, and also in the aerospace world, that would be for, you know, obviously things like uh, lift forces on wings and control surfaces. So we're open to suggestions on what next for ACSI. And then the third option is we have taken Nastran Solution 400 and we've embedded that within uh, the Adams environment. We call that option MaxLex. So the number of ways you can approach the problem, let's look at the details of each one. Starting off with FE part, uh, a new element, I say new, it's probably a couple of years old now, but uh, it's a native element within Adams. Uh, and it's a 2D and 3D beam. This is only for geometric nonlinearity, not material. But you can see from the uh, simple graphic up on the top there, uh, this highly flexible element which is wrapping itself around a rigid bar. So this is capable of, of very high levels of geometric nonlinearity. Um, and as we said before, there may be some cases where the displacement is such that a, a linear assumption is no longer good. So the applications here we can see um, would be in sway bars, uh, leaf springs, door latches, uh, coil springs. So a lot of applications where you can simulate the body with a 2 or 3D beam. 
So one particular application might be for uh, brake hose. Obviously, the brake hose moves between a, a rigid part of the vehicle, typically the frame or body, uh, and it goes to a moving part, which is a suspension system of some sort. Here's a rear suspension on a commercial vehicle. And then here's a particular application. Um, this is on, again, it's a fairly heavy duty vehicle, but this is on the front suspension steering system. And you can see here on the right hand side, we have a, a right turn and then lower down a left turn. And the resulting shape of the brake hose is obviously very different. So on the one hand, you want to look at the forces at the end of the brake hose to make sure that it's not uh, too high strain. And on the other hand, you also want to see where the brake hose is going to go to ensure that it's not rubbing against any other part of the system, uh, causing chafing and potentially a leak uh, somewhere down the road. So without going into the details, but basically this was using an FE part to simulate the brake hose itself. Um, and although it may be very difficult to see here on the screen, actually what we're showing is the white mesh um, is where the brake hose ended up under physical test. And the blue representation is actually the analysis having been done in Adams with FE Park. We've only got three of the four positions, but if you can see on your screen, uh, there's an extremely close agreement between the physical test results and the prediction uh, using FE Park into, this, into where this brake hose goes. Here's another application. Again, it's brake hose, uh, but this is again on, on, on a commercial vehicle. Here we have a rear axle. Um, obviously undergoing displacements, um, both in-phase and out-of-phase jounce. And it's very important to understand, of course, again, what's happening um, with these hoses. Are they long enough? Are they going to be overstretched? Are they going to rub on anything? So geometric nonlinearity, perfect application for the FE part. Let's move on to option number two. This is the Adams Mark co simulation. So, this is where you take an Adams instance um, and a Mark instance and you couple them together using the co simulation interface that we provide. A couple of examples here. Um, obviously, you know, some material and geometric nonlinearity going on. If we look at the workflow, very straightforward. We have an Adams model. In this particular case, there's an ATV here. For those of you who've got very good eyesight, you may notice that the lower control arm is missing in the Adams model. That's because we've actually represented that in Mark. So within an FE preprocessor, we mesh this component up. And then using the co-simulation interface, we bring these model environments together. The interface controls the co-simulation. We have uh, displacement or positions coming from the Adams model feeds that information to Mark. Mark says, okay, based on the position you've given me, the resulting force must be this. And then Mark sends back to Adams a force number. And that's how they step through the whole process. For plotting, in, in, um, we can look at the Adams model in the Adams environment. The Adams model doesn't recognize uh, the FE piece of it, so that needs to be post-processed in Mark. Or you can co-animate using a third-party tool. Um, and in our case, uh, we've used something like a CEI Insight. Uh, but then you can pull the, the models together and co-animate. So looking at that in action, uh, here's a use case, for instance. Uh, we have a full vehicle, vehicle dynamics model, so a vehicle with suspension, uh, inertia properties, everything you would expect uh, in a full uh, Adams vehicle model. And in this particular case, uh, let's say, for instance, we have a, it's not really a fuel tank, but let's say this is a battery pack, which is suspended below the vehicle. And unfortunately, the driver has just hit some rigid object in the road. So we know that there's going to be um, some kind of deformation going on here in the, in the cover for the battery pack. So we have looked, at, we've modeled the battery pack itself in Mark. And then the boundary conditions, uh, as for you know, how the battery pack moves and how, it, how the whole system behaves, are provided by Adams. And over, over here, you can see this rigid piece of the road. It hits the front edge of the battery pack, causes some permanent deformation. So an interesting application of this uh, nonlinear material uh, coupled with the multi-body dynamics application. Of course, there are many, many more.
same uh, example just viewed from below. Obviously, we've slowed the movie down so you can see a little bit more about how the, in this case, is stress, obviously caused by the deformation. But we have a big hit on the front of the battery case here. Uh, there will be some movement, some vertical movement. As the hit takes place, then the vehicle is going to jump up out of the way a little bit. Uh, but the two stiff areas where we've got the vertical wall at the front and at the back, uh, that's really where they light up with stress. Okay, let's look at the third option. Uh, we call this MaxFlex. This was released into production late last year. And this is embedded nonlinear. So this is material geometric and, and boundary condition nonlinearity. So what is it? Well, I mean, it, it's a very logical extension of the linear flexible body. So for users of, of that uh, flexible body, you'll just see in the drop-down menu here, we've included a BDF option. So we have MNF, modal neutral file, for linear flexible bodies. Now we have BDF as an option. This is bulk data file. So for any of you FE analysts, uh, you'll recognize that as kind of being the input file uh, for an FE model. So very easy interface. You, you pull the BDF in in the same way as you pull an MNF into your, into your Adams environment. We also have a, a translator for Abacus uh, files. So for any of you where your FE analysts are um, using analysts, uh, sorry, Abacus and not NASRAN, then we have a translator which will convert this into a PDF format. So we're supporting both NASRAN and, and uh, Abacus uh, in preprocessor pre for FE. It's an implicit nonlinear analysis, and I'll get into that in a moment. The movie here is just showing you the ease with which you can, you can pull in parts to the model and combine them to the Adams representation. And again, you know, very similar kinds of use cases as, as we've looked at previously. Um, we, we, we've also provided some additional functionality. Um, especially relevant is going to be this ability to swap between rigid and flex. So if you look at the example down in the bottom here, uh, once the vehicle model is stabilized, there may be some significant part of this event where you don't need nonlinear. So let's look at the rear suspension here. Uh, as the vehicle appro approaches the ditch, um, really nothing's going on. So that could be a rigid part until just before we would want to swap to a flexible part. So we're introducing this rigid to flex swap. And then in later releases, we'll also be uh, including a flexor flex. So it would be a linear flex body swapping to a nonlinear uh, flex body at some point before the significant event takes place. And you may ask, well, why swap? Simply, um, there's a very significant computational overhead associated with these nonlinear bodies. You know, you don't get anything for nothing. So if you want higher fidelity, then, you know, it takes more computing time. So in as far as we can, we've made it efficient uh, by keeping it simple uh, until you need the high fidelity. And then we've got these uh, on-the-fly switching options. We can include multiple nonlinear flexible parts in a model, um, and then there's interface support, which I'll get in onto in a moment. So some of the technical details here for those considering using this, you know, um, the connections and the loads ought to be very familiar to the to the Adams user. Um, when it comes to the solution, it's really hidden. By and large, it's hidden from the user once you're in the BDF environment and you and you bring in your um, you bring in your nonlinear flexible representation. There's really nothing extra to do. You can see the integrators we support. It's also uh, SMP, so we can we can speed up the process of solving these bodies by distributing amongst the system. And then some post-processing benefits. We, you know, we post-process again in the Adams environment. So the workflow, like I mentioned before, really very straightforward. We, we read in the BDF, connect it to the to the, the Adams model, the MBD environment, and then we can post-process results, uh, stress, strain, displacement, again in the Adams environment.
a little bit more background detail as to how this is all working. So here's the EPI preprocessor of your choosing, but basically we need something that represents a Solution 400 BDF, whether it's from Abacus or from NASFRAN. That is included in the Adams view, the preprocessing part for Adams car. And then within Adams, um, we're really using what we call a nonlinear finite element service, but basically this is calling upon NASFRAN to solve its part of the problem. But it's not a co-simulation, so we really need to differentiate here between how we were co-simulating with Mark earlier, um, and now we've embedded NASFRAN. And I'll, I'll, I'll explain the difference between those two approaches in a moment. And then we go out to the Adam Solver, and of course at that point we can post-process here, but we also have the availability of things that are very important to the finite element analysts, you know, OP, OP2 files, so you can go out and post-process it in your own environment, as well as FO6, a lot of information about the finite element part of the model contained here in those files. So it's not lost, the fidelity is not lost back in the finite element world. Okay, so let's look at this um, MaxFlex. What does it really mean? And the two words I want to highlight here are implicit and embedded. So we've got the NASTRAN Solution 400, which is an implicit solver embedded within Atoms. So what's the difference between embedded and co-simulation? Um, on the face of it, we have one integrator and therefore one license. So what does that look like? So down here on the left-hand side, you can see this is the MaxFlex approach here. So yes, we have Adams. It's coupled to a, a Solution 400 service, but Adams is the integrator. Adams is in charge all the time. It's deciding what to do. On the right-hand side, we have uh, our co-simulation interface. So this is where we hook up with something like Mark or EDAM. This is a true co-simulation. Each of the codes taking part in the event has its own integrator. They're sharing information and deciding, you know, on time steps and what have you, but um, there are separate uh, integration schemes going on. It's not that one's better than the other necessarily. It depends on what you're trying to solve and your own CAE environment, but this is the fundamental difference between the two approaches. So typically with the embedded approach, there's going to be less tuning. You're not worried about both integrators uh, and keeping error tolerances close. Um, it's all handled within one, and, and generally a faster model setup. Okay, so that's the embedded piece. I go down two, sorry. I thought we were also going to look at the implicit. So then moving on to now looking at the um, complete availability of flexible components in Atoms. When, I know we're not covering linear today, but between Adams Flex and ViewFlex, then you have options for linear flexible bodies. And over here now, we're looking at FE part, co-simulation, and embedded. So let's look specifically at, on the nonlinear side now. And if we look at, I mean, obviously the, the FE part is, is really just geometric, so I'm not comparing like for like here. But if we look at the op options between co-simulation and embedded, the highlights here might be um, for co-simulation, you need a finite element um, software uh, for post-processing the results. In MaxFlex, we can do that natively within Atoms. Um, here, again, because it's a co-simulation, you need both licenses. You need Atoms uh, and you need Mark. Whereas here for MaxFlex, the Solution 400 is, is embedded in the, in the Mark code, uh, sorry, in the Atoms code. So it's all there as, as one, it's not two separate licenses. And again, just to highlight, uh, the first one is a co-simulation, the second one is, is native within Adams. I know I've said this before, but it, it's very important that, that, that you recognize that um, stress strain recovery within Adams, no, can't do that. Um, but with, uh, with the co-simulation with Mark, uh, but yes, we can do basic finite element post-processing within the Adams environment, but we do provide you with the output files, 
So you can read those back into an FE post processor to do the more advanced um, analysis of results. Okay. So hopefully that's easily understood there. Okay. So the, the obvious question at that point is, okay, so Adams has provided me with some options here. If I need material nonlinearity, um, what should I do? Uh, am I better off with MaxFlex or, or doing a co-simulation? There's no simple answer to that. I mean, uh, but I've tried to at least outline a few criteria that you should you should look at here. First things first, and fairly obviously, uh, what's the format of your finite element? I don't know if you're doing it yourself or whether you have a, uh, a complementary group that does FEA for you and provides you with your meshes. Um, but do they use NASRAN or Abacus, um, or are they preparing models in MARC? In other words, is MARC your favorite nonlinear code in your company? Fine. But that would be the obvious chance to use uh, co-simulation. But if you're already using NASRAN or Abacus, then MaxFlex would be more logical. It could be that, you know, uh, MARC, for instance, uh, supports more element modeling types than NASRAN. So you may have something very specific in terms of, of a material characteristic that you're looking to be able to reproduce. It's possible that it's not available within the NASRAN element library. You might have to go to MARC for that. We've got a lot of technical literature which explains what kind of, you know, a material characteristics are available in each. I'm not going to get into the detail of that today, but it's definitely worth looking at if you're looking for something, you know, a little bit more exotic in material types. Um, there's more opportunity that it will be supported in MARC. And then, of course, um, as we've pointed out before, is integrated post-processing important to you? If you're trying to keep this in, in an all-MDD environment, then MaxFlex would be your choice, probably. Uh, but if you have access to FEA post-processing tools, then, uh, you know, you could just as well use the MARC co-simulation. So those are some things you can look at up front. And then, you know, as a user, uh, what may be some of the constraints that you would face? You make some decisions up here, but, you know, then what? Um, certainly, I would say don't try and get into nonlinear domains, nonlinear responses, until you're very comfortable with linear flex. You know, obviously, um, some people are still just using rigid body representations, and that's absolutely fine for a lot of cases. Making the, 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 the leap into nonlinear, you know, there's a certain learning curve that you need to, to move up, having done that. And I would say that once you're, you know, uh, very familiar, uh, very capable to function within linear flex, then nonlinear uh, is not a big step for you. But I would say, you know, experience in linear flexible bodies is a prerequisite. If you're looking at co-simulation, it's true to say that you need knowledge of both Adams and Mark. There's various parameters that you've got to set up in both domains. Now, it doesn't have to be you as an individual user. You may be an Adams expert. You might not know Mark. But if you've got somebody in your organization that you can partner with, between the two of you, you can easily set up this model. But uh, whether it's an individual or whether it's a group of people, you are going to need knowledge of both products to be able to successfully set up a COSIM run to run efficiently um, and to have uh, accurate results. By comparison to run MaxFlex, as a user, of course, you need a BDF. That's got to come from somewhere. But you don't need really any uh, prior knowledge of NASTRAN and how that all works. Everything is, we have one integrator. It's controlled by Adams. Everything's set up in the Adams environment. So if you're kind of working on your own and you don't have a lot of FE support, uh, maybe MaxFlex is, is a better option for you. Okay, so let's look at a use case example. Um, we've worked very closely with Volvo Cars. They've been extremely generous um, in providing information for us and working in conjunction with our development teams to look at uh, real-world applications of these nonlinear capabilities. Uh, and, and here, just as a kind of introduction, you know, you will be familiar, I'm sure, at least in the automotive world, there are some events where, you know, they are very severe duty. If you run at high speed into a curb or you slide sideways into a curb, you know, these things can happen, unfortunately. Uh, they do happen. Not something you want, but uh, 
at the same time, if the, if the driver makes a mistake, you want to make sure that as far as possible, uh, they're not going to be put in, into danger. There's a couple of use cases here, driving over the curb and, and, and the curb strike. Let's concentrate on the curb strike or skid against curb. This is where the vehicle is sliding sidewards, either in a skid or maybe on ice of some sort, but it's got a, a, a lateral velocity and it's going to be brought to rest by something just hitting the wheel and tire the curb. So here's one event where, um, you know, Volvo call this level one. Level one is relatively low speed. So we have a low impact velocity. The vehicle here um, is modeled as an Adams full vehicle. Most of it's not being seen, obviously, because we're concentrating on the contact point here. But in, in this particular event, you know, we, we've got, uh, in this case, a linear flexible body for the subframe and for the control arm, relatively low speed. And if you really concentrate your attention here on this piece, hopefully you can see my cursor, but on this piece of the control arm, uh, when the strike occurs, there is some kind of uh, plastic deformation on, there's some residual strain here. You know, was there permanent deformation? Hard to tell, but this is an event that is borderline nonlinear. Let's just call it that. You know, so in this instance, you know, are you okay with an MNF? A linear flexible body, or should you be nonlinear? You know, perhaps you don't know. But just out of interest, we ran this both ways. So this low speed curb strike, we modeled the control arm as a linear flexible body and a nonlinear flexible body. And you can see here, uh, this is force versus time. Uh, the, the comparison between linear and nonlinear is extremely close. All right, so the, 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 the end result of this one-off analysis was, you know, for this particular set of events, I don't need nonlinear. It's going to take me longer to solve because it's a complete nonlinear event, and I don't need to carry that computational cost because my assumptions with linear are good. Fine, so you proved it to yourself. You're not sure if you need it or not. You want to run it once. Everything's good. But... There is a level two test or with a higher impact velocity where it's exactly the same event, but the, the contact speed is greater. And you can see here again on the lower right-hand side, uh, at this point, the prediction is that, hmm, we, we, we've reached the yield point in the material. Uh, we've gone plastic. There is permanent deformation. So even after the event, when the vehicle bounces back away from the curb, you can see that the, the lower control arm does not spring back. This is a pretty classic uh, definition of a nonlinear event. Here we are, the actual physical test itself, although we're very uh, kindly uh, have allowed us to show this movie. Here's the lower control arm. Um, it's all over very quickly, of course, you know, about a fifth of a second. But during the event, uh, there is large displacement. And once the load is released, it does not return back to normal. So what does this look like in the finite element world? It looks like this. After the event, you can see that the, the thing is turned up um, and there's, you know, high stress here. This is plastic strain, but, you know, obviously a lot of strain here, yielding going on. So if we're to take this high-speed event, Remember before, you know, we ran this as a linear flexible body. If we, if we do the same with the high-speed event, this top curve here in green uh, would be the force time results. And then just to, to compare, we've run this as a co-simulation with Mark and also as the embedded solution 400, our max flex capability. And these are the red and the blue curves. There are some very slight differences due to, simply due to the way the model has been set up and some of the bushings have been represented. But in effect, there's a very close correlation between the two nonlinear analytical approaches. And again, this is, this is in the MBD world. The really important thing here, though, to take away is that, uh, again, it, on this axis we've got force. The linear flexible body, simply because it's always linear elastic, it doesn't have the ability to yield. So it keeps on deforming until the energy in the event basically goes to zero or reverses, and you get this 
you know, forced displacement or forced time curve here, which just keeps on growing up until uh, the event reverses. So you have a force up here of whatever. In the real world, though, you, you, you've put enough into the system to cause a permanent deformation. You've gone beyond the linear elastic material. Uh, it's gone plastic, so it yields. So in reality, there's only a certain amount of force that that component can take before it yields. So here we are, uh, a force down here, maybe let's just let's call it 50% of what was predicted with a linear body. Why is this important? Well, fairly obvious, I think, because you know, if you were to design the rest of your system, your bushings, your subframe, your subframe mounts, based on this force prediction here, you would be over-designed, because in reality, there's no way that the system, the lower control arm here, can support that amount of force. This is the maximum, so you need to consider this force when you're designing the control arm and the adjacent components and all of the attachment load path points. Okay. Then some, uh, some applications here. So um, again, some of these are very similar to the types of applications you could be using with the code simulation with Mark, uh, but we can, we can be modeling the, the twist beam suspensions, um, the suspension bushings, the rubber mounts. They could just as easily be done in Nestran or, or Mark, depending upon the rubber material types that you want. Large displacements in, in aerospace. Here, here we have you know, helicopter blades in the static condition that they, they rest down a lot. And then obviously under loading, under the aerodynamic loading, they bend the other way a lot. So the total displacement's large. So uh, a number of uh, you know, different applications. I'm sure you can think of some of your own. Uh, I think that you know, the real point here is that um, it's worth considering nonlinear. If you need it for fidelity, then you need it. And we're giving you options to be able to incorporate it. If you don't need it, that's absolutely fine. You know, most cases, you would hope that a linear flexible body was sufficient, and I would suggest absolutely stick with those because they're going to solve quicker for you. Uh, but the whole point here is that our user community have requested that they can get this higher fidelity because they have use cases that they need it for, um, and now we've provided this in, in a number of different formats really to suit your own user conditions. With that that, that, that ends the formal part of the presentation, so, very, so thank you very much for, for listening.